Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Oftentimes, Adam and I in the field will get questions from our customers. We both work for Microsoft, if you aren't familiar uh, with our show and are listening in for the first time. But we often will get questions from our customers on training. Where can we get training for Microsoft? And this show was also spawned by one of our listeners emailing and asking us, like, hey, I am an engineer, a security engineer at this company. We have E5, and it is overwhelming the amount of stuff that is there. Like, where do I start learning about all the different things? I might have started off in Intune, but now I have to learn Purview, which is completely different. Or maybe I have to learn more about the XDR platform, which, again, is new uh, compared to device management. So this show today, we're going to talk about all the different places that you can get training for Microsoft and for other things within technology. So starting off, the best place to get anything on all of our solutions, all of our products is learn.microsoft.com. From there, you can get FAQs, you can get deployment tips, you can get just generalization on features on every single thing that we have to offer. We have technical writers, specifically their job is to keep the content current. And so it is fairly good. It's not always, always up to date, but I would say for the most part, that is the end all be all official documentation for Microsoft. It also has free training for certification tracks. So Microsoft has certifications for every single one of our things. There's SC, which is like security. So like SC 100, which is our cybersecurity architect, SC 200, which is our security operations, 300 identity and access management, 400 is information protection, so on and so forth. If you're starting off in security and you don't have it, I highly recommend at least taking the SC 900. That is the generalization of the security stack, essentially, within Microsoft. It's a general, is it general non, not a deep dive into one area, but just kind of like testing your knowledge overall on the security stack and compliance as well. Then, of course, like there's AZ, you know, like AZ500, which is the Azure security. There's the MS series, which is just general Microsoft. And then there's even other ones, like if you're into like Dynamics or AI or application development. So there's a ton of certification tracks and each one of them will walk you through exactly what you need to learn for the certification. So definitely take a look at that. You can just look up on learn.microsoft.com for the specific cert that you're looking for and get free training for the whole thing. And to be fair, you don't actually have to go take the certification exam to get value from the certification exam training. So if you know, like, hey, I really want to learn more about Microsoft's data security platform and purview information protection, you could go look at the training for the SC400. You don't actually have to register or take the SC400 exam. You don't have to do anything. It's just on the public web. And so that's a great kind of first step to get familiar with the product line and the features and start to dive in deeper iteratively. It's really well done and, and a great way to do it. Now, if you do want to take the formal certification exam, make sure you talk to your Microsoft account team because some customers receive an investment from Microsoft that can help maybe pay for some certifications and exams, even pay for some certification boot camps and classes. So if that's of interest to you, follow up with your Microsoft account team. Your customer may be part of that program, your company. The next thing I wanted to mention is also extremely valuable. It's called Ninja training. And This started off within the security community, the technical community for Microsoft, and it was company or uh, customer driven. And they said, hey, we really would like more 
technical deep dives into the security stack and the PG, the Prem folks at Microsoft said, let's do it. And so they came up with this ninja training, which is very, very prescriptive. It is a deep dive three to 400 level videos and uh, documentation. And, you know, they even aggregate some some presentations that aren't even part of Microsoft. They're they're part of other security organizations or folks from Microsoft who have given talks at other conferences. And so it's really good stuff. And it's everything security compliance related. So there's a ninja training specifically for XDR. If you want to learn all about Sentinel, there's one whole thing just on Defender for Endpoint, Defender for Office, Security Copilot, Defender IoT, and then, of course, the compliance stuff, Purview and Priva. They all have their own information protection, an entire ninja training just on information protection or e-discovery, DLP, lifecycle management, insider risk. So it is really, really good. What I'm going to put in the show notes is a link to Rob Trent's Substack. And Rob Trent is a cloud security and uh, architect at Microsoft. He used to be a, an MVP. He does a lot of uh, blogs and uh, you know podcasts as well. And the Substack link that is there is basically uh, listing out all of the current known ninja training that we have out there. And there's more that are getting added all the time. So definitely take a look at this. You know, if you're looking for something specific within the security compliance or identity space, we probably have a ninja training on it. So if you're looking for a deep dive, that is definitely the place that I would go. Ninja training as opposed to the formal certification stuff is by its nature, much more informal. In many ways, maybe even deeper. Look at individual product level as opposed to more of a functional or, or capability driven exam. It's very product specific from the product group and really, really well done. I would give this a huge plug. It is super deep, super detailed. It's multimedia. So it, there's some text, there's some video, it kind of changes format. So if you don't learn with all the same delivery throughout, this is the kind of training for you because it switches gears continuously. Here's a presentation, here's a PowerPoint, here's some slides, here's some text. Here's a website to go review, go read this documentation. It jumps around. And I think that's really powerful. For most people, they learn best by absorbing information in different ways. So really, really well done. Can't say enough good things about this. It is official in terms of it's written by Microsoft FTEs. It comes from the product group, but yet it's still less formal than like formal documentation or formal certifications. And so if you kind of shape at those, because, you know, there is a style to formal certification and, and you don't learn as well in that mode. And, and some people don't, they get a little anxious over it. This may be a better delivery for you. So be sure to check it out. All right. The next one is Microsoft Mechanics and Microsoft Mechanics is a YouTube channel. It's great. They're like bite size videos. They're usually not that long, five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And they have Microsoft Mechanics videos on everything. Some of them are like a quick overview of a specific product. Sometimes it's a new feature. So it ranges not just in security, it's across the entire Microsoft stack. So if you want to learn about Microsoft Fabric or you know our approach to AI, you know, I was just looking at the channel and I saw that there was a video that was just put up on GPU enabled Windows 365. And I was like, that's I knew that was coming, <laughs> but I didn't know it had it had happened. So I found out something new just by looking at the channel. So there's, you know, upcoming features. There's all sorts of stuff there. So definitely take a look at that. I would subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't. That way, you know, it does not take a lot of time. You watch one, in, you know, per day, five, ten minutes. Also available as an audio podcast. So if you'd rather listen to it on the go, obviously you won't have the benefit of the screen share. However, I think for the most part, the presenters do a really good job of verbally explaining what they're covering as well. So I, in fact, mostly get my Microsoft Mechanics through audio podcasts, and that's another good way to follow it. But I think back to, if you remember, uh, Jeopardy champion James Holtzauer, he said he studied for Jeopardy by reading children's books. Sometimes it's really powerful to just get that overview level of something and know a little bit about it. And 
you know if you need to come back to it later, you can always go deeper. But having an awareness of that's a thing that exists is really powerful. To Andy's point, he remembered and was able to watch the mechanics video about GPU-enabled W365 cloud PCs. And so if in the future a customer is saying, man, I have this really demanding graphics workload, we would love to move some of our CAD work to W365, but you know it, the, the built-in graphics just can't handle it. And he could say, well, wait a minute, we have GPU-enabled cloud PCs as well. And so just having that knowledge, being able to come back to it later is super valuable. So love Microsoft Mechanics, five to 10 minutes, quick bites, usually presented by really solid presenters who know their stuff and know their product line and produced in Microsoft's production facilities, which are, I mean, better than a lot of um, studios across the country in terms of like TV or Hollywood productions. I mean, it's incredible that the quality of these presentations that are kicked out too. So another great resource. All right. We've mentioned our technical community, but the tech community is a great resource. There are forums and blogs, and there's a, a video channel as well on YouTube. And so a lot of the tech community will have monthly meetings. They'll all be recorded. Sometimes they'll bring in folks from the PG. Sometimes they'll bring in MVPs, you know, and they'll give these presentations on deep dives or upcoming features or just how to do things in general. So. There's always history that you can go back and watch that sometimes is still relevant. Uh, one example is I had to give a, a presentation on Defender for Containers, and I didn't know a ton. And we haven't done a show on it quite yet, but I went back and watched the tech community video on that and learned a ton about it. So, you know, there's they have very good um, guests that come and speak on there. And then the forums, there's always people who write good blogs that's usually folks that are Microsoft or MVPs that are writing the blogs. And then there's a discussion portion as well. So if you have a question, you do have to register for the forums, but you know, as long as you're a registered user, you can post uh, a question or answer a question for someone. And so there's a lot of good stuff that happens on the tech community uh, pages. These are the canonical place where new stuff gets announced for almost every product group. They have a tech community blog, and this is where what's new gets posted first with an explanation of what it is and usually bring in like the feature PM to write a blog about it. So for example, I've always followed Entra ID development very closely, and it is one of the best tech community blogs out there. We've got between Alex Simons and Alex Weinert, I mean, those two cats, they know their stuff and they're very, very solid writers too. And so whenever we're like making a change, Alex Weiner will take you through the why. He'll explain, here's the risk, here's what we're mitigating, here's why. Or when a new feature comes out, Alex Simons will often introduce the new feature, briefly explain when and why you'd want to use it, and then bring in that feature PM to walk through the feature in greater depth. And then it will end with, hey, here's when it's going to be available. Here's the technical documentation. So in terms of people ask, like, how do I stay up to date? with all the innovation you're working on, everything coming out, it comes at me too fast. Go follow the tech community blogs for the areas you're responsible for and monitor them regularly. This would be a great time to use an RSS reader. A Google reader is gone. I love Feedly is still a really good one. And there's some others out there as well. Plug these in an RSS reader, stay on top of these tech community blogs. But in terms of where does new stuff get announced, where's the first place to find out? It's always here. This is where new stuff gets discussed and explained first for whatever you're into. If it's Entra or security and compliance or whatever, Dynamics, it's Security Copilot. It's all out here. So that's a great, great, great resource to stand up of what's new. All right. The next one that we wanted to talk about is something that's fairly new. It's just been out for a couple of years. It's called the Customer Connection Program. And there's a Customer Connection Program for almost every single thing when it comes to uh, security, compliance, and Windows management. So if you want a Customer Connection for uh, data security privacy, you know that all covers the information stack, protection stack, the purview stack. There's a Security Connection Program which covers all of our Defender products and uh, also CNAP. And then there's a management uh, connection program for Windows, for Intune, uh, the cloud experience. And then we have um, Entra 
for all of our identity portion and then copilot for security. So each one of these different programs covers different, you know, the different parts of our stack. But what it is, is it allows you a uh, time to meet with and connect with product group and engineering for each one of these and kind of just discuss what's working and, and also like things that are coming up uh, in the pipeline. It gets you invited to a team site that you can join. Um, and there's a lot of great discussion going on there between not only PG, but other customers sharing feedback on what's working, what's not working. This is where you get invited to private previews, public previews, and get included in them. This is where the PG will regularly deliver presentations and invite you to calls and say, hey, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific next Tuesday, we're going to get on and talk about this new private preview we're doing in Entra for Feature X. Like this is... Customers always say, how do I get kind of in the cool kids club? How do I know what's coming? How do I get invited to all these private previews? How do I get to engage with PG? This is the how. Um, free to join if you're an enterprise customer, maybe even I, I think SMC customers can join as well. Um, we'll have the URL in the show notes, aka.ms slash join CCP. Absolutely phenomenal. Join them all. Even if you're not highly interested in all of them. It's great to have the resource available when you need it. Hey, I need to go ask an Intune question. Let me go see if this has been discussed in CCP. I, I am subscribed to all of them as an internal Microsoft employee, just because this is a great way for me to know what's going on with all those products. And they also send out weekly emails. You get an email every week and it's, this thing's probably three pages long. <laughs> it's extensive with here's all the private previews going on. Here's all the calls we've had. Here's all the calls we have upcoming. Here's the recordings if you missed the call. Here's the slides if you missed the call. Wealth of information. Like I will tell a story. Before we announced public the passkey support in Entra ID, I had someone kind of tip me off and say, hey, this customer's asking about passkeys. We just did a presentation on that in the customer connection program. So I was able to go review the call download the slides and learn like, hey, here's where we're at. The customer was really interested in syncable pass keys, which are not currently supported in Enter ID. So I was able to just go to them and say, hey, yeah, we're not doing that yet. I'll follow up with you when we have something more to share. Right now, we only have device bound pass keys. So that was just easy way for even me inside of Microsoft to go get a really quick answer to, hey, what's the current status of pass keys in Enter ID? So love this. Cannot recommend it enough. All right. I wanted to mention a couple of things that actually aren't in our notes. So as Adam was looking <laughs> at them, he's going to be like, ah, oh, they're not here. So one thing to mention, if you are a Microsoft customer and you are a unified customer, so unified support, mm -hmm. uh, which is our support contract, has like billable hours. As part of that, if you are a unified customer, you can get some education or how do I do this? Or you're going to get assigned a CSAM or customer success account manager. And you could say, hey, can you find someone to do, you know, a presentation on Intune or whatever it is? Like you can just pick something and they can find someone to do hands-on training for you uh, as part of that unified contract and it would get billed for a couple hours back to that. Mm -hmm. The other thing, as Adam was talking, which was kind of like upcoming features and changes and all that other stuff, something that as a Microsoft administrator or anyone who is a Microsoft customer should be monitoring is the message center, which it, uh, within the Microsoft Admin Center. And as part of this, um, it's something that I learned because, uh, you know, it was something that I never really checked even when I was a Microsoft Admin. So I am guilty of mm -hmm. not keeping up. But what I learned this week <laughs> was that you can get a weekly summarized email of all the different messages. So if you go into the message center, there is a setting to subscribe to emails. I know that email is by far the, the, the most you know used tool in corporate America. So just getting a summary of the changes, you know, this is like you are deprecating, you know, this feature or making MFA mandatory for admins, you know, in the Azure admin center, stuff like that. Any major change, anything that we're getting rid of, um, it always, always shows up in the message center. So um, that's something that I would definitely monitor. And each one of them have links to the blogs. Like if you just go to the message um, and it's like, hey, we're deprecating this, there's usually a blog or, or a learn document that's attached to it that you can pivot and like, you know, go and read more about it. Two great call outs. Let me just reemphasize for those with a unified agreement, do not, do not 
do not think of that as just pro uh, no sorry reactive support do not think of it as reactive support there are so many proactive resources you can use there um, as part of that agreement that is woefully underutilized by customers use your unified agreement use your hours if you need someone to come in and do a two-hour workshop on this and bring your whole team aboard and learn about Intune. Go do that. There's great folks who come in and deliver those sessions and they're so bright, some of our best and brightest on that team. So work with your customer success account manager, your CCM, and ask for what you need and don't just use it for tickets because you're missing probably the majority of the value of it is really in that proactive support. And with Microsoft being such a big company doing so many things, I'm sure you can find something interesting for Microsoft you want to learn more about. Then for the second thing, Andy, you were talking about the message center. I love the email digest. I forgot that was a thing too. That's a great call out. The other thing I always like to mention is the planner integration with message center is another great option. And to your point, we now that we're on the other side of it, because I came from customer side too. When I was there, we didn't monitor message center pretty closely. We were pretty good at it. If you're not, or you want to get better at it, there's integration where you can automatically have every message in message center become a task in planner. And planner is great because then you can assign it to people. So you can have someone whose maybe job is like the dispatcher for message center stuff that comes in and they can go through planner and assign this to this person, this person, this person, this person. And now it becomes a task they actually have to check off. Like I did this thing. And if it's just informational, the checkbox is great. I read it. If it's a prepare for change, checking the box means you prepared for the change and you made people aware of it and did whatever you needed to do to get ready for it. So definitely I will say being on the Microsoft side, Message Center is the canonical resource to announce breaking changes to your environment, changes that will be impactful and you absolutely need to be aware of them. Otherwise it looks like you're asleep at the wheel to your leadership. And yes, you can all come and scream at Microsoft to make us the bad guy and, and we'll take it. <laughs> We're good at it. But at the end of the day, if you really just want to be up to date and on top of everything happening, you have to be monitoring message center closely. It was really interesting because at one of the conferences that I went to, the the experts conference, which I plug all the time, mm -hmm. there, it's uh, hosted by Quest. I'm actually going to them um, in a month, but we had one of the folks from the PG at that conference. And that person was in charge of deprecating legacy auth for exchange throughout all of the customers. <laughs> and it was really interesting hearing him speak because they, he said, you know, for all the people who are using legacy auth, we sent out a message in the message center and they could tell how many people actually read it. And as you can guess, it was a very low percentage of customers who actually read that, hey, legacy auth is getting deprecated. And it was kind of like... A, they would turn it off for a bunch of people and then see who would scream about it. A lot of times that's how we do technology. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just, you know, he said, we sent out messages every single time in the message center. That's where we communicate and they can tell that the percentage of people looking at it is low. And so what Adam and I are <laughs> saying is we'll be one of those customers. Listen to us track it at least get the email digest so that you can like mm -hmm. get an idea of what is happening you know and with the secure future initiative which is a major push up microsoft which we've seen a lot of impact internally inside of microsoft of stuff changing and breaking and the answer is it's sfi we have a, we have a kind of a free pass a hall pass to break stuff right now it is microsoft's number one priority that is not lip service that is absolute fact and ceo all the way down is giving people permission to basically break stuff in the name of security and so obviously we will be very mindful of avoiding impact to customers of communicating changes of giving customers time to adapt to change however I will say you will see more of this. I am confident in saying that, that Microsoft will continue to harden our defaults to secure our customers by default, even if they don't take action eventually to do what's right to not only secure Microsoft, but secure the world and secure our customers. And so those changes will absolutely be communicated through Message Center. You will have time to read and react. But if you're not buttoned up on that, you have the chance to miss out and there will be more. And I'm not foreshadowing because it's not like I know something I can't say. I'm just speaking the obvious here of we are have really empowered everyone at Microsoft that if you can say this meaningfully improves security, then do security. You are you are empowered to do that now, even if it means breaking stuff. So 
Of course, we don't want to break our customers. We definitely don't want to take our customers down, but we do want everyone to be secure. And we're going to make those changes if we can prove that there's more plus than negative. Um, and we'll continue to do that moving forward. All right. So in general, for when it comes to learning, you do want to probably build your own lab. So um, when it comes to like personal things, there's free ISOs for Windows servers and Windows clients on the Evaluation Center. So just look up Windows Evaluation Center. You can get a six-month license for servers and three months for clients. Hyper-V, which is built into uh, Windows. Um, so uh, I, although I do think that you need Pro now to have Correct. Windows Pro to have uh, mm -hmm. Hyper-V. So yep. you do have to have Pro license. Or you could use VirtualBox. VirtualBox I've used for many years. It's free and uh, open source. So you can use that to spin up your own VMs. If you're brand new to Azure and you want to build some stuff in Azure, you can sign up and get a free trial and they'll cost you a few hundred bucks for a credit. Same thing with AWS. Um, I had a trial to AWS and played around with it until it ran out and built a couple VMs. So you can do that uh, with any of the cloud services. You can also build your own hardware. Um, there's plenty of different examples out there. Use something called Unraid, and uh, there's a, uh, I think you can get it for free, but there's also a very cheap like um, lifetime license for that. And you can build Unraid on almost anything. The OS runs off of a USB stick. You can put it into an old PC, and then it has virtualization built in. Uh, so the basis of Unraid was essentially uh, a NAS. So the whole point was a NAS, but then you can use that hardware to build virtualization um, VMs and, and containers. So really great platform there that I use for my own lab. And then any SaaS tools that you're using, there's almost always a developer tenant. Uh, so M365 has a developer tenant. I know Salesforce, Okta, Box, they all have dev tenants. I've used their dev tenants before to just play around with stuff. <laughs> so they're not always full featured. ServiceNow. <laughs> ServiceNow as well. Yep. Terrible um, dev experience, but they do have one. Yeah. Yeah. They're not always full featured, but you can do stuff with them. Right. So sometimes you can do more with others <laughs> depending on the, the dev tenant, but it's something. And so if you're looking at learning more, dev tenants are free and usually um, a way to go to learn stuff. Um, and then just a, a couple of final resources here. LinkedIn Learning, want to do a plug for that because there's a ton of really good just general training, training on Microsoft or just, you know, security, IT in general. Uh, podcasts, you know, both audio and video. Obviously, if you're listening to this one, um, this is one of them, but there's tons of them out there. A lot of blogs. And then if you're looking at more specific for each vendor or solution, they usually have their own set of training. So uh, like I'll use AWS as a good example. They have a very robust training program themselves. A lot of free training that you can take online as well as, you know, in classes and certifications as well. Reddit is a great tool that a lot of people use. There's a ton of subreddits that are tech and security focused. Twitter is, you know, always a good resource <laughs> to find out what is happening in the moment generally. So that's more security news wise. And then finally, let's, let's you know, save this one for one second, because okay. this is a whole other discussion. I want, I want to touch on a couple of things you said, but then we'll go on yeah, to that yeah. last point. Developer tenants, M365 tenants in, in general, let's unpack that a little bit. Andy mentioned developer tenants, definitely check those out. They're not like full everything in E5, but there's enough there to be dangerous. If you want to learn how to stand up, enter ID connect, and just kind of the overall administration care and feeding of a tenant, it's a great place to start. I will say if you're doing any sort of serious M365 administration, your organization should invest in a test tenant. I am shocked at large companies that don't have a test M365 tenant because we're talking trivial money. I think that the minimum bar to entry is like five or 10 licenses in, in most cases. So we're talking... 250 to 500 bucks a month. Like, and that is like no brainer money compared to the risk you're taking not having a test environment. And to me, that's where I've done a lot of my best learning. Obviously, as being part of Microsoft, we got a demo tenant and being able to just bang on stuff and break stuff and break stuff I did many times <laughs> helps you learn how stuff really works. And so, one thing I'll say with having a developer tenant, a test tenant, if you want to know, like, what would happen if I do this, just go do it. It's almost impossible to kind of plan for every scenario and every permutation of settings and what would be the resultant behavior. So 
a lot of times when customers say, what would happen if I do this? My response, I'm not trying to be like a jerk about it, but is, I don't know, go test it. Tell me, you come back and tell me what happens when you try it. And uh, Andy, we talked about before we went on the air, how at organizations you've been at in the past, they've designed their test environment to as closely mirror their production environment as possible. So their M365 is stood up in a very similar way, similar policies, similar conditional access policies. That's a great idea too. My only concern with that sometimes is you need to be able to have that sandbox where you're allowed to break things. And when that's like a, a mirror of production, maybe there's a little less leeway to going in there and being a bull in a China shop which sometimes is a good way to learn too. So long story short, get dev tenants, go poke around with them, try them out. And there, there are some good ones out there. Um, Salesforce, I'll give a shout out. Really nice dev environment, really full featured actually. They really do let you poke at it. So um, they do a great stuff there when you're testing out test tenants. But let me plug, definitely, if you don't have a test tenant, go get one. Um, get your management to fund that. And again, not only just for the avoiding a breaking change, but for the testing, like what would happen if we did this? Or how does this work if we change that? Instead of opening the support case or trying to ask your Microsoft team, to be honest, you're going to get a faster answer and a more accurate one if you test it yourself. Really great point that you made, Adam. And it actually made me think of something on having a test environment that you can break stuff versus a test environment that's more mirrored to prod. And at my last company, we actually had two test tenants. Yeah, there you go. One tenant was one that was very as closely mirrored in policy to the production tenant as possible. And then we had what we call our security tenant where it was whatever you want to do. <laughs> Sandbox, <laughs> wild, wild, go West. ahead and break whatever you want to do. Yeah. So um, yeah, we had two different test tenants and that I found that was to be a, a great way to test things. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there is no replacement for just tinkering and seeing what would happen and seeing if I, oh, if I do this, these two things, what happens if they're together? If I put the humidifier and the dehumidifier in the same room, what happens? I want to know these things. <laughs> these are good things to try out. Yeah. Okay. So the final one is have a good circle of support like from your coworkers and your friends i'm super fortunate that i have a really good tech circle that i have um you know adam and a couple of our other microsoft folks that we used to work with a bunch of the ts's uh, the technical specialists who are all on um, a thread that we kind of go back and forth some of it's personal but a lot of it's like hey you know i'm testing this home automation like or you know what's the best uh, you know, camera that you're using for your home or routers or, you know, whatever it comes to, you know, we talk about Unraid or we talk about NAS or whatever it is, you know, I think the last thing that I was talking about was uh, the new uh, MPU Copilot PCs. I wanted to see if anyone had you know, used one and what their thoughts were, stuff like that. And, um, and then Adam, of course, you're on the Microsoft Pro, uh, Surface Pro X, I think. And so you have Surface a Pro 9. Yeah. So, I do have yeah. one with uh, an ARM chip. It's not the latest, but. Right. And so obviously, you know, Adam gave his feedback on ARM, which was really helpful, of course, because um, that's what the NPUs are. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I have coworkers from other companies that I still keep in touch with. Sometimes they'll send me, um, you know, a message here and there like, hey, I'm dealing with this thing or what is the best way, you know, does Microsoft have this thing to solve for this issue? That's a great way to kind of build your circle. It's also a great way, and this is kind of unrelated, but um, you know, I, I do a lot of mentoring for people who are in tech, and it's a great way to just kind of keep in touch because you never know when something might happen, and you might need to kind of, you know, use that connection to get in with your next company. So, not to say that that's like the reason why we keep in touch, but I think just having a good circle of friends and coworkers. Uh, to bounce ideas and and just talk about what you're working on or questions that you might have on any any technology um, is a great resource. Having quote unquote network both formally and informally is incredibly valuable. And I know some cybersecurity folks scoff at things like LinkedIn, and I get that there's a lot of very 
active salespeople on LinkedIn that can maybe be a bit annoying. However, having having that community, having that network around you, maintaining and growing your network over time, I think way outweighs getting cold messages and mails from, from salespeople you don't want to hear from. I mean, at the end of the day, being able to stay connected, super valuable. And I know, again, a lot of right-brained people chafe at the idea that your network can really help you land a job, land your next job. But I will say for me, um, and even as somebody who thought like, man, I just want it to be a peer approach where it was just based on the quality of my resume and the quality of my work. And it doesn't matter who I know. Like, I don't, I don't want to get jobs that way. But man, when you start getting jobs that way, you realize like how powerful it is and, and knowing people makes all the difference. And this isn't just about employment. Andy's point is about learning and being able to expand your knowledge and just Surrounding yourself with people who are curious is, is a great lesson for life. I mean, let alone cybersecurity, but always surround yourself with curious people, people who want to learn it all, not people who know it all. Nobody wants to hang around with a bunch of know-it-alls, but people who want to learn new things and try new things and are willing to be gracious with their time and share their experiences. Those are the kind of people you got to gravitate to because when you want to bounce an idea off someone, someone who's curious may have already tried it. Or maybe curious in how you get along and want to have interest in your experience at the end of the day. Do not sleep on coworkers and friends and how they can impact your ability to learn over time. Because I will definitely say for me, for Andy, we're in that same, same circle. And of the six people in it, we all used to be in the same role or in adjacent roles. We're all in different roles today. We've all gone different paths, different directions. And two out of the six of them were laid off from Microsoft and both boomeranged back over time. And now we're all back at Microsoft, but we're in different parts of the company. And some of us are salespeople and some of us are technical salespeople and some of us are program managers and we're all over the place now. But we have that shared bond of working together at one point in time and shared interests and experiences and being from similar geography. It's me and a bunch of Scotties and one Minnesotan and we, we get along great. Two Minnesotans. Two Minnesotans. That, well, I don't know. <laughs> JG, I'm not sure if he claims his Minnesotan <laughs> background, but anyhow. Anyhow, yeah, great. At the end of the day, I could wax nostalgic all day, but man, having that community, having that tribe very, very valuable. And, and certainly love hearing the projects they're working on and knowing people to go ask like, Hey, how, how'd that work out for you? I'm curious. I'm, I'm interested in buying that or trying. All right. Well, this was a fun episode to do. Yeah. Hopefully you learned something as always, our contact information will be in the show notes, as well as all of the links that we talked about during the show. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I do at least I, I don't know how often Adam checks the email, but I definitely read all the emails that people send personally to us. And if there is something of, of value, we'll definitely discuss it you know, on the show and everything. So don't hesitate to reach out. Emails are there. Our websites are there. Our LinkedIn profiles are there. Um, so if you have a question, if you have a topic you want us to talk about, just reach out to us. Thanks. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAWZERO and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.